In 1986, Nintendo continued their streak of releasing groundbreaking, genre-defining video games with Metroid for the Famicom Disk System, and later, the NES. In recent years, this game has garnered a reputation of being frustrating, cryptic, and skippable. I'm here to tell you I believe that that reputation is wholly undeserved. Metroid is a fantastic game through and through. This game respects the player and itself. It's challenging, rewarding, and flexible. It offers tremendous replay value and replay incentive, and it has the best soundtrack I've encountered in a Famicom title to date. Welcome to Metroid, Haters Mad Edition. Before I talk about my experience with Metroid, I have to address a stigma I've noticed that surrounds this game. If you search Metroid NES review, you're likely to encounter one or more of the following. Metroid, a frustrating time capsule. Metroid NES review, is it fun? Metroid review, NES, why it doesn't hold up after 30 years. Metroid NES, a flawed but ambitious start. And then in the thumbnail, the outdated mess. And for those interested in getting into the series, you have the recent popular upload by Arlo, So You Want to Get Into Metroid, where he says, and I quote, First and foremost, I am here to happily tell you playing the very first NES Metroid game is not required, and no one would ever fault you for skipping it. It was revolutionary in many ways, sowing the seeds for an entire genre, but playing it today is rough. It's really difficult, it's really obtuse, figuring out where to go takes a ton of trial and error, it's got loads of places to move through, and there isn't even a map. If anything, it's more like a prototype for the games that would come after. Right off the bat, there are a lot of things that I disagree with regarding that statement, but he immediately follows that up with, quote, I've never played it, and I don't plan on doing so. <laughs> like, maybe lead with that. This isn't to say that every review is negative, as many are glowing, but it's something that I have noticed in general with a lot of 8-bit era games. There's this concept of games becoming aged or unplayable with time that doesn't quite sit well with me because it's often used dismissively and without pointing to any genuine criticism. And to clarify, I don't think that there's anything wrong with not liking a game. Sometimes, however, I feel like people can latch on to somewhat unfair assessments of games that aren't entirely fair. I see people take a sentiment, absorb it, and then later pass it off as their own, often unconsciously, but with complete confidence. In the process of playing Metroid and thinking about this video, I was reminded of a lecture by Terence McKenna on the importance of psychedelics and going it alone, and how closely it feels related to this issue of retro video gaming. So if you want, you can replace psychedelics with retro gaming, but by the end of this quote, I think you'll start to understand what I'm talking about. In the psychedelic experience, there's this issue of surrender, because a lot of people want to diddle with it. They want to be able to say they did it, but they don't ever want to face an actual moment where they put it all on the line. And yet the whole issue with this stuff is to let it lead, to let it show what it wants to show. So somehow, individually, we have to reclaim our experience. The real message, more important even than the psychedelic experience, the real message that I try to leave with people is the primacy of direct experience. That as people, the universe is within your reach, always. Everything not within your reach is basically unconfirmed rumor. 
and we insert ourselves like ants or honeybees into hierarchies of knowledge. This issue of first-hand experience applies beautifully to retro gaming. Curiosity is a huge driver when it comes to wanting to play some of these games. How can you really know what an older game has to offer without playing it? How can you fully comprehend how the game works as a whole without striving to complete it? If you aren't willing to be patient and observe and improve and explore, what is your critique really worth? If you don't know how it feels to play a game on original hardware versus an FPGA versus an emulator, how can you really know if it makes a difference to you or not? These kinds of questions just don't get addressed enough when it comes to retro gaming. The more games I play, the more I realized how nuanced the spectrum is of 8-bit games. It's exciting, and Metroid as a complete experience really surprised me. So with all that out of the way, let me tell you what it was like for me personally to beat Metroid. Four times total spanning the Famicom disk system and the Nintendo Entertainment System. What the differences are, what's in the game, how it all fits together, my brief history with the franchise, and finally what my experience was playing and beating this game for the first time. So as with most of these older games, it's generally a good idea to check the manual first. This isn't required, but the artwork is really cute, and in this case, Metroid has a ton of information. First and foremost, it has the story. So the, base, the basics of the story are the Galactic Federation was founded in the year 2000, but that's based on a different calendar than our own. This federation resulted in a massive increase in intergalactic trade. Groups of space pirates arose to take advantage of this situation and started thieving. And as a result, the Galactic Federation Police Force was established to combat theft. However, the police are ineffective. The Federation instead turns to contracted space warriors to hunt and capture the space pirates. Cut to the year 20X5 and the space pirates are added again. They attack a recent research facility containing an unknown life form on planet SR388. And I'm thinking, I wonder if that's included in one of the codes for the password system. But the life form is currently suspended in cryogenics, but it can be reactivated and multiply in a span of 24 hours if exposed to beta rays, which presumably the space pirates are doing. So the police force discover the space pirate secret hideout on planet Zebes, or Zebeth, I believe, as it says in the actual intro of the game. But they don't really do anything past there. The police remain ineffective. And since they're not able to make any notable progress, they contact Samus Aran, who is the most notable of the bounty hunter space warriors, a mysterious cyborg with a very powerful suit capable of absorbing energy from defeated foes. The game begins after Samus has already succeeded in penetrating Zebes. So now it's a mission of seek and destroy. So, as Samus starts the game, it becomes clear this is a 2D side-scrolling action-adventure platformer and a little bit of race the clock if you understand that the best ending is locked behind how quickly you beat the game. You start in one of five major zones and you work your way through defeating both mini bosses in order to make it to the final boss, which is the mechanical life form Mother Brain. Now, as I said earlier, there are two different versions of this game, the NES version and the Famicom Disk System version. I started with the Famicom Disk System and one of the reasons I chose to do that was because the Famicom Disk system supports saving to disk, whereas the NES version, it's password system. The Famicom disk system just does it better. There are more differences that I'll get into later, but because I knew I wanted to take my time and fully explore Metroid's world, I chose to go with the disk system first because I didn't want to have to bother with the passwords. The five major zones in this game are Brinstar, the starting area, also known as the Rocky area, Norfair, which is known as the Fiery area, then you have Crade's Lair, which is mini boss hideout number one, but in my opinion is harder than hideout number two. So then there's Ridley's Lair, which is hideout number two. And then lastly, there's Turian, which is the final zone of the game. That's where you find the Metroids and it's where you find Mother Brain. There are 10 
upgrades that you can get in this game. And each one actually drastically changes the way that the game feels. There's the long beam, which allows you to fire a shot all the way across the screen. But the downside is if you miss a shot, there's a limit to the number of projectiles you can fire at once. So it's usually it just as fast as you can mash the shoot button. But if you miss, then it's limited to three. There's the ice beam, which allows you to freeze enemies. And that allows you to then use them as platforms. And this is probably probably one of the most important things when it comes to sequence breaking this game, which is something that Metroid is known for. There's also the wave beam, and this beam is something that you can completely ignore. I tried it my first time because I wanted to see, but it does twice as much damage as the normal beam, and it moves in a wave pattern. And this is advantageous because it allows you to hit enemies that are usually below your range. You can't shoot down in this game. You cannot shoot at angles. It is only up and to the side. And the wave beam is the power up that you get that allows you to hit some enemies that you would otherwise just have to jump over. And it can also shoot through platforms. The screw attack is the most powerful upgrade in this game. It makes you somewhat invincible in the air, though there were plenty of instances where I would still take damage, but it just allows you to blast through enemies. I think that it does as much damage as a missile blast. When you jump, there are two different kinds of jumps, a regular up and down vertical jump. That gives you the advantage of being able to adjust more accurately and the air and then if you're running and moving and holding a direction as you jump that will allow you to do a spinning jump which i'm not sure but it seems like it can get more distance on the x-axis but either way that is what you need to do to unlock the screw attack and the only real downside to this spinning move is that when you're adjusting you're always moving in an angle you can't just move and be still as you can with a regular normal up and down jump there's also the high jump which lets you jump higher and reach different areas this can speed you up and speed up the process of moving across the world of Metroid. Then there is the Varia suit, which makes you take significantly less damage if you land in a pile of lava or sand, and it also makes you take less damage in general when you're getting hit by regular enemies. The first upgrade that you will likely pick up in this game is the Maru Mari. And that's what allows Samus to go into that patented ball form. The ball lets you crawl or go under. And it's cool because the ball is also a little bit bouncy. You can kind of bounce and finagle your way into different areas that you might not think that you could get to in ball form. And Additionally, there are bombs that you can pick up that you can use while in ball form. This is very important for discovering secret areas in Metroid, and it's also important for blasting yourself into areas that you otherwise would not be able to get to. The most obvious example is when passing through the first corridor to the right of the starting corridor. There are obviously breakable blocks, and the only way to break them since you can't shoot down is to use the bombs. There is the missile rocket which is a consumable projectile that you're able to fire at a cost. And this is also cool because it's one of the only games I've played so far that makes a real use of the select button, because the select button is what you use to switch between whatever beam you have equipped at the time and the missiles. And then lastly, there are energy tanks. The energy tank serves two purposes in this game. It increases your overall health, that you're able to expend, and it also fully replenishes your health in one go. And unlike some other games in this series, there is no other way to fully recharge your health. When you restart the game, you're gonna be restarting at the base 30. So in some instances, you may find an energy tank and not want to actually pick it up because you might want to save it for later when you're lower on energy. As for the enemies, there is a huge variety in Metroid, but not all of them do things that are too different. There are 33 different main enemies and Three of those are bosses. One of them is essentially part of a boss though. In Brinstar, you've got Mellows, Rios, Rippers, Screes, Wavers really didn't like these guys. They kind of have that sine wave sort of pattern to them. Zebs, these are what you use to abuse, to refill your missiles and to refill your health. And lastly, Zoomers, you just can't escape them. In Norfair, you have dragons, which are seahorses basically. Gamets, which are Zebs but harder. Garutas, Melas, Multiviolas, which I'm not sure if it should be pronounced multi-viola or multi-wala. So I think for the rest of this, I'm just gonna say wala when I'm presented with viola. Novas, 
polyps. These are significantly more challenging on the Famicom Disk System version of this game because the projectiles that they shoot out kind of go like popcorn in all directions. Whereas when I was playing the NES version, they seemed to just go in an arc. Ripper 2s and Squeeps. In Ridley's Lair, you've got Des Gigas, Pulses, more multi voilas, voilas, zebos, and then Ridley himself. In Crade's Lair, you have Gigas, which is just a tougher zeb, Mimos, Rippers, Sidehoppers, Screes, Zilas. Then you have Fake Crade, which is a not real Crade. I think that only exists to make you think you might have defeated Crade, allowing you to try to go to Torian uh, to waste your time because as I said earlier, this is a bit of a time attack game. But then you have Kraid himself. And in the final area of the game, Torian, you have Metroids, which are the scariest enemy in this game and potentially the scariest regular enemy in any NES game I have played so far. Then you have Rinka, which are essentially Cheerios or onion rings, and also one of the most frustrating and scary in their own way sort of enemies in this game. Then you have the, the Zebatites or the Zebatites, which is these function as a life support system for Mother Brain and they are required to defeat in order to reach Mother Brain. The issue is you have to put constant pressure on them with missiles. I think it takes 10 missiles to get through one layer and if you don't absolutely get all the way through them and then you don't pay attention to them, they will regrow. You hate to see it. And then finally, there is Mother Brain, which I believe takes 27 missiles to defeat, but I think it might be 28 because you have to break the glass first. And then this is important, a final note from the manual, the total time you take to complete your mission determines its final outcome, which brings me to the endings in this game. There are five different endings, and the endings are based on the amount of time you take to complete the game. Over the course of my playthroughs, I got the good ending, the secret ending, and then the super secret ending twice. But one of my super secret endings I got only after beating the game, after beating it and getting the secret ending. So I was already in my leotard and then I went from zero suit to bikini. My first playthrough took over 10 hours because I was choosing to explore everything to the fullest extent I possibly could, but my final game time was under that because at certain points when you die there's not much of a reason to continue as opposed to simply resetting. Also worth noting, all gameplay for this video was recorded on original hardware modded with the high def NES mod kit, and no save states were used in the recording of this video. Also important are a few things that Metroid lacks, the first of which is an in-game map. There is a map present in the manual, but in the game itself, you kind of have to navigate and keep track of where you are on your own. And so this prompts a question. Is getting lost in a video game a bad thing? Is getting stuck the same thing as getting lost? I would say that getting stuck and getting lost in a video game are not the same things. In Metroid, it can be easy to get lost if you're not paying attention, but it's borderline impossible to get stuck. The second thing that Metroid lacks that you might be expecting are save rooms. In some of the later titles, there are save rooms where you can save your progress, you'll respawn there if you die, and you can recharge your health and your missiles. That is not present in this game. This world is hostile. It is not for you. It is out to get you. It's not your friend. It's indifferent to you. You have to force your way through. The game won't do it for you. Metroid doesn't care if you beat it or not. It's just there. Another thing that needs to be addressed is difficulty. It's often said that this game is very, very hard. This game is difficult, but anyone can beat this game. I would even go as far as to say that with a little practice, anyone can get the secret ending of this game. Comparing it to other titles I've played and reviewed so far for the NES and Famicom, I can tell you that it is nowhere near as difficult as games like Ghost and Goblins, Bird Week, or Sky Destroyer. I would say for the most part, this game has a similar difficulty to The Legend of Zelda, but the peak difficulty is probably a step above that. Another thing that is associated with this game is hidden areas. This one is a little divisive and I'm 
going to cover it more in depth when talking about my personal experience with the game, but I will drop you with a hint that I think the idea that there are things that are impossible to find in this game is overblown. It's understandable to an extent, but you reach a point where it becomes pretty obvious where bombable walls and shootable ceiling tiles may be. And unlike some games, you have no limit to bombs, so there is relatively little cost to searching for secrets and relatively high reward. Mechanically, this game feels very solid. The jumping affords the player more control than I've seen in any NES Famicom title to date. The shooting is also related to how fast you can press the button, which I always appreciate. Running produces a satisfying sound effect, as does landing on different terrain. They do a lot to give you the feeling that you're in a suit of armor. Also, in this game, Falling into a pit does not equate an instant death. This is a breath of fresh air. And should you die, you will restart back in the area you most recently died in. It feels tight. You can be precise with your movements and your shooting. And you feel each upgrade. I do have a brief history with the Metroid franchise. Some of the sound bits, like Samus's entry jingle and picking up an item, they do trigger a little bit of nostalgia for me because the first Metroid game I ever played was Metroid Prime. And for me, that was a Christmas game. I was very young, I had just gotten a GameCube, and that night, that Christmas night, I plopped that disc in and it scared me. Legitimately terrifying experience for maybe I was 10 at the time, maybe 11. I don't remember, but it scared me. And it also had that time sequence where the clock's running down and you have to escape. And that was also something I'd never experienced in any video game before. And so it freaked me out. I did eventually make it to the surface and I did explore a little bit, but I had just never played any game like that and I really didn't know what I was doing or getting into. So I dropped it. In 2015, I did end up revisiting Metroid Prime. And this time I would say I made it around 40% through the game. But life happens, and things came up, and I didn't get to finish it. And that's about the whole of my experience with Metroid proper. Minus a few super brief test runs for Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion. So while I haven't played many games in the series, I kind of prefer it that way. To see and experience how things change firsthand. I have played plenty of games that have taken from this series, though. Cave Story, Hollow Knight, and Dark Souls are some of my favorite games. And I can tell you that even having played those games before Metroid, Metroid has a lot to offer. It's still well made and it's a ton of fun. And that's why it's so surprising to me that so many people just seem to write it off like it's this perfectly skippable, nothing mess of a game. I had a blast playing this game. I liked it so much I decided to go for the best ending. And with a little planning and a few attempts, I actually got it. It's not this impossible thing to surmount. I'm also working on a guide on how to beat the game in under an hour in what I would consider the most stress-free way possible. So prepare for that. But my experience with this game was really positive and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let you know about it right now. As I said earlier, I started with the Famicom Disk System version of this game. This is the first game I've played on the Disk System, and it is like charm and comfiness, the system. You put, I put the, <laughs> I put my AV Famicom on top of it, and then you plug the RAM adapter into the top, you plug this in separately, and then you load games into the disk bay, and oftentimes you have to pop them out and switch them. And every time that you load in a game, you hear it take the disk and like the belts start turning, and uh, overall it's just a really comfy experience. And also, you have the intro start screen with Mario and Luigi going back and forth and playing. It's just fun. It's just a fun system. I'm probably going to review this as hardware in current year later down the line. But the first thing you're greeted to, no matter which version of Metroid you play, is an absolute banger of an intro track. It's just brooding. It's moody, it's Judy. And this is also one area where the NES and Famicom versions don't line up. They both have bangers, don't get me wrong, but the Famicom disc system title screen music, I would say slaps just that little bit harder.
So then you're treated to the Samus fanfare when you start the game. And this is one of just like, it's immediately iconic. <laughs> It puts you in the mood and it's like she's stepping into the game, you know, from that third dimension that we don't see and just fading in. And then that Brin Star theme comes on. It's just you are treated to three absolute all time certified hood classics in a row. And then you're treated to one of the most brilliant non-tutorial tutorials I think I've ever played in any video game. If you start running to the right, which is what you're kind of trained to do in this era of games, you will run into a wall that is too short. You can't crawl, and so you see it and you don't know where to go. And you're forced to go all the way back to the beginning. Most people know these days to just go to the left first. And in fact, in any 2D game, I always go to the left if there's an opportunity to, just because I know that it is expected of me to go right. But if you go to the left in this game, you jump over a ledge and then there's an item. And this is one of the only areas in the game where you actually can't go anywhere until you pick it up. You're locked. You can't leave this. You have to pick it up to progress. And then once you do, you get the Samus item pickup fanfare. Which is just the fourth in a row. Amazing track. The music and the sound effects in this game are next level. So for me at this point, it's already, it's it's a great start to a game. It's it's just, it's kind of genius. And it gets me ready, it got me in the mood to just explore Brinstar to the fullest extent I possibly could. There was an instance in my first playthrough playing where before I got the bombs, potentially, I think I went down into Norfair. And I realized very quickly that the enemies were way too hard. So I headed back up and um, after finding the bombs, I then immediately wanted to go back and check out what was under those obviously bombable blocks in the second corridor. And then that led to Kraid's Lair, which was even more out of control. But I still tried to explore this area for a good 20 minutes. I just felt like there was gonna be this reward, but I just didn't really know where I was going. And to get any of this stuff, I did have to pick up the missiles first. That is the first item aside from the Maru Mari that you need to pick up. So with Kraid's Lair being so far out of reach, I just decided to explore Brinstar more, and this is where I kind of fully explored it. I picked up an E-Tank, I picked up more missiles, I picked up the Long Beam, and that was a huge game changer for me because I wanted to kind of be able to snipe enemies across the screen. And then, this is actually where, by accident, I discovered the Ice Beam. They place a waver enemy in these corridors, I think because one of the most effective ways to shoot them is to just try and use your bombs. And so as you're using your bombs, you may accidentally hit the tile where it'll break and you can fall through and there's fake sand and then you can go down and find the Ice Beam a secret ice beam in Brinstar. There's another one later in Norfair, which ends up being a disappointment for me because I had already acquired it. But that is your first real taste of the secret, like the secret secrets in this game. There's no real indication. There's only a hint because it shows you there is some space below there, right? It shows you that there's something, but you don't want to fall in there. You think maybe it's just for show, but then if you try and kill this enemy, there's a good chance, since the pattern kind of goes, you know, in a figure eight across this hallway, that you're going to fall down there. And so that was enlightening. So once I felt like I had fully explored Brinstar at this point, I headed down to Norfair, which is the fire zone. And at this point, it it was still, it still felt too hard for me. A lot of experienced players will pick up the various suit knowing where it is in Brinstar before going through to this area. But since this was my first time, I didn't know where to find it. I think that I knew going into this that the various suit was in Brinstar, but I hadn't really experienced or encountered enough to know where to look or to even know that there are breakable ceiling tiles yet. 
I think that it was in either Norfair or Ridley's Lair where I first found out that you could shoot the ceiling tiles and that they sometimes would break. I'd also like to mention I died at least 40 times and likely closer to 50 or 55 times over the course of my first playthrough. The number of times that you start the game is actually kept track of in the Famicom Disk System version, as well as the number of days that you're on, which in this game, a day is an hour. But not all of them were counted because a lot of times I think that I just turned it off and then restarted because I didn't want that attributed to my time. But if it's the number of times you started the game, maybe it was 40. It, it was a lot. I died a lot the first playthrough, and that's fine. Death is fine. It just takes a little while to get your energy back unless you find an E-Tank. So the world in this game is impressively large for the time. It is an expansive world and it's a varied world. The thing is though, the first time you play it, it feels much, much bigger just because you don't know where you're going. It's kind of like the first time you get a new job and you make the commute to work. If it's in an area you're not familiar with, it can feel like a really long time. But you give a few weeks, a few months, and then it feels like no time at all. Even if it's 30 minutes, it's just like, yep, I've hit this checkpoint. And now I'm basically there, even though it's still 10 minutes away. That's kind of how Metroid feels playing through subsequent times, because you've already done the hard legwork of exploring and figuring out where everything is. And Norfair is also where I learned how to most effectively take advantage of the short red Super Mario-like pipes where Zebs and the like will come out of where you can farm. I was for the longest time just shooting these guys from afar, but the best thing that you can do is kind of plop yourself down on a singular tube and just drop one bomb at a time or later two bombs at a time that will kill either one or two of them. And then hopefully they will drop energy or a missile. And in Norfair, this was also where I learned that a dead end usually implies that there's a secret somewhere. So just shoot every wall and bomb the the bottom just for good measure and it's also interesting because there are some secrets that lead to nothing there are things in this game that are designed to take up your time because the best endings are locked behind lower times and interestingly in this game i found the wave beam um somewhat by accident just by walking around that is how i guess most things are found in this game but um i i think i was told that it's hard to find but when i found it i was stoked i didn't realize i think fully that i would have to switch back to the ice beam and I almost immediately kind of wished that I had the ice beam again but the wave beam was a lot of fun and after picking it up I found the route of where to go to get to Ridley's lair and I thought you know I thought about going back to Brenstar but I decided not to and instead went all the way down this is also where like the first big troll and maybe any NES game I've played, well, no, actually, it had to be the grumbling in, in Legend of Zelda, the meat guy. Have to buy bait at some point, and it just looks like meat on the bone, basically. <laughs> um, or, or the secret in Zelda where you walk down and you just lose 30 rupees. If you are in a dungeon and happen to have found a map, that's where you can see a more complete... <laughs> But this is one of those early classic video game trolls where this they show you an E-Tank and then there's hidden lines through the floor and you just fall right through the floor and you can get back up somewhat easily, but then just trying and trying again, it's just like, they got me good. And the wave beam came in handy against Ridley the first time. I ended up just like, I was trying to just blast him with some missiles, but then I ended up just going to the bottom and firing from below him because the wave beam does have the advantage of being able to shoot through platforms. And then after that, you get to pick up an E-Tank, so it's really not that big of a deal. But you are confronted with a missile door that takes 10 missiles to get through instead of the regular five, so that is a little annoying. But since you just beat Ridley, you have 75 missiles. So actually, I take it back, it's not even annoying. At this point, I decided to finally take on Crade's Lair, and my, I, I have to also say, Crade's Lair has the best theme music in this entire game. And that is probably my favorite track on the NES or the Famicom so far. Maybe the Zelda dungeon music, but this one, it's just like, it's atmospheric, it's moody, 
it it hits everything. It has a wild flare in it, and then it just goes like goes back to that. Mm. Fantastic music in this game. But unfortunately for my first playthrough at least, I was accidentally not recording for a period of about an hour and a half. And in that hour and a half, that's where I found the Varia suit with the high jump. I was able to get it. And then I also went down and took out Kraid. And this time with Kraid, I used missiles. But in later times, I just found it easiest to just get in the morph ball and just spam bombs. If you have the various suit and you have a good four energy tanks, you should be good to go. And then there's actually a hidden energy tank that I only knew about from watching like video, like random videos about retro games where like they blow it up. I was having a lot of trouble getting it the first time, but then I found out like if you roll off in the ball, you can get it. And so there, there, he's definitely harder than Ridley, but there are lots of ways to take him out. And it, it's not so bad. But after that, I went back up to the very, very tip top of that first really large tube, I'll call it, in Brinstar. And at the top, there are two keys that you can shoot and they unlock from beating the mini bosses. And that unlocks a pathway that extends over the bottom that allows you to then reach the final portion of the game. Torian, I think I died five or six or maybe even seven times before I beat the game the first time going through there. The Metroids are absolutely terrifying. They cause legitimate dread. The last time I think I felt this much dread over an enemy or an area was probably the first time I played Dark Souls after I defeated Quelag when I went into the demon ruins and I saw Ceaseless Discharge in the distance with his like spider tentacle things just going wild. And I took a look around and I was just like, nah, not today. And I turned around and that's what I wanted to do here, but I couldn't because it was the last area of the game. And I tried just running away from them, but I found in a lot of instances, the easiest thing to do is to just kill them. If you have the missiles for it anyway, because you do need a lot of missiles to get through this final area because of the z or whatever they're called that are the life support system from other brands. The Metroids are required to be frozen first. So you have to freeze them and then you have to blast them with five missiles. If you're lucky, they'll give you some of those missiles back. If you're not, you'll just get health, but sometimes you honestly need it because if they do latch onto you, the only way to get them off is by spamming bombs. It's funny because I've always seen Metroids and seen what they looked like. For some reason, I never thought they were that big. They're huge. Um, I always just thought they were little and cute. And I was just kind of like, you know, that it's what the series is named after. It just doesn't seem that scary, but it is. Anyway, the final area, I FaceTimed my sister the first time I, I got there because I expected for some reason to beat it the first time after I had figured the Metroids out. And, um... She called them Cheerios, but those little guys that spawn, those onion rings, they make this area very hard. It's the hardest area of the game. It's not even close. You've got turrets up top shooting at you. There's so much on the screen that there is a significant amount of slowdown. And because there's so much, you're actually thankful for it because it gives you just a second to breathe. You gotta constantly be pumping missiles into these things to get through to the next area. And then once you finally make it to the end, you don't wanna get trapped in the lava down below. It's too dangerous. And you have to freeze these little guys or they just, these little Cheerios, or they keep on coming at you. But once you finally beat Mother Brain and you finally get through that last sequence and then you're jumping up and the time's counting down hands might be shaking it's just like what a feeling beating this game this game makes you feel good for beating it maybe if you got the over 10 hour score and samus has turned around you're a little embarrassed but you still beat the game and once you beat it one time i mean you're almost ready to just start a new game right away because there are so many things you know you could do better you know you can do faster you know where the key items are any game that makes you want to get right back in it right after beating it it's doing something right and metroid is doing something right all the subsequent playthroughs i played of this game though were on the nintendo entertainment system version which has several advantages the most notable being there's no real loading times the password system is also exploitable so while it's annoying and time consuming, there are some advantages that it offers. But the real thing that sets 
apart the NES version is the ability to continue a new game immediately after the other game without going back to the file select screen. Zero Suit Samus is exclusive to the NES version of this game, and it's such a fun reward to be able to play as her. Overall, I just love that experience. And it actually might nudge the NES version just a little bit over, even though I consider the music for the Famicom version to be slightly better, though some of the sound effects are a little more annoying. And then even with the advantage of being able to save, I think the NES version just with the rewards that it provides you for beating it might be superior. And the last thing I did was test out popular codes. Justin Bailey, Narpa's Sword. There are a variety of codes, but after beating everything yourself, it's not as interesting. And before I reach my final thoughts, just a few addresses to some of the common complaints that I referenced earlier in this video. Secrets are too hard to find. I think that I disagree. There really aren't that many places where super secret things are hidden. One of the secrets, there are things I missed in the first playthrough. Uh, that I did see later. But you you don't need a map really to beat this game. And you just need to be playing it consciously. But if you're playing it like it's a chore, then chances are you're not you're going to need that map. Once the game sort of shows you where secrets tend to be located, you gain kind of this understanding of where to look. And then on top of that, you do just end up bombing most areas just for fun. Another complaint is that the game doesn't tell you where to go. And you know, really, I just, I think that that's a good thing. I don't really want to be told where to go in every video game that I play. The statement that this game is essentially a prototype is false. This game is a complete package. It's a full experience. It's mechanically sound. The design is sound. On paper, there, there can be things that you don't like. Not everyone will enjoy this game, but to call it a prototype is just, that's just not fair, in my opinion. Another complaint is that too many areas look samey. Part of this is because it's a time attack game. Some of the most samey areas you're gonna find in Norfair and Kraid's Lair, these are kind of critical moments in the game. But as I said earlier, lost and stuck aren't the same thing. And so long as you're paying attention, you can even keep track on graph paper if you'd like. It's not hard to just draw, you know? I really think that the different zones are differentiated quite well. And it's really just balancing corridors horizontally versus vertically. How many entrances? Is there a secret exit? Where might that take me? There's not too much really to it. It's, and you know, like on the long end, this game is gonna take someone who's doing it particularly slow, probably around 12 hours. Like that's not that long. I think this game for the time and for the resources, it uses those resources really well. I, I never felt like, oh, am I in Brinstar or Norfair or Ridley's or Crates? Like it's always obvious where you are. And then lastly, that this game is not worth playing. Only you can answer that. If you're looking at this game and you're interested in it, I think that you should give it a shot. And I think that you should do it as, you know, as much as you can the right way. If you do want to use a map, there's nothing wrong with that. I would just say just try it without and just see what it has to offer. And to continue that quote from Terrence McKenna from earlier, after talking about how we tend to insert ourselves into hierarchies of knowledge, he goes on to say, and I quote, So we say, well, what's going on in the world? Well turn on CNN, and then somehow we're ordered. Then say, uh-huh, okay, it's 85 degrees in Baghdad and the wind is out of the Northeast at 15 miles per hour. And we feel somehow better now because we're getting the information. But what we have done is sold out direct experience. And if you're asking me, I would say, don't sell yourself short. This is a good game and it's an important game. And the only way that you're going to know what it really has to offer is by experiencing it firsthand. I think Metroid is a beautifully designed game. I think that it respects and rewards the player who is willing to give it the time of day. It also offers two distinct games, two distinct experiences in one package. On one hand, it's an exploration game. And on the other hand, 
you're racing against the clock. It has two different modes of play, which encourages replayability. I do think that the Famicom Disk System is ideal for beating it the first time. Just given the leniency of saves, not everyone can sit down for 10 hours a day and play it a whole game in one day like that. But I think that for subsequent playthroughs, the NES has the advantage. I really ought to get an NES advantage. I really don't think that a lot of the complaints about this game are justified. I think a lot of people love to hate on games, and I think sometimes that just makes for interesting videos. I get it. I just, you know, I was wondering if I was playing the same game as some of these guys at some points because I was really impressed. And maybe it's because I have put myself in that position, in that zone, to be playing these games on original hardware, kind of in order, or in chronological order of release as I've been doing. But, you know, I've beaten Hollow Knight, I've beaten The Radiance, I've beaten Cave Story, I, I like, I, I haven't played a lot of Metro games, but I have played a lot of the best games, like, considered to be the best offshoots that are out there. And I'm telling you, if you like Cave Story and you like Hollow Knight, you owe it to yourself to try. Just try playing this game. And if you don't like it, that's fine. I think in the end, I, I'm not sure that this would take the spot of The Legend of Zelda as my favorite game of this series so far. But I have to sit on it a little bit longer. I love playing as Zero Suit Samus. And this sort of game that you can beat it it takes you really long to beat it the first time, and then you're able to use your skill and knowledge that you've gained to beat it very quickly. That's a trait that I think I personally find very admirable. It's part of the reason why I've loved Dark Souls so much over the past 10 years since its release. But overall, Metroid's great, and uh, thanks for watching. Peace.